fall within the rubric, generally speaking, of the responsibility to protect. Uh, that doctrine was emerged out of experience in the 1990s with regard to interventions in Bosnia and Kosovo. It was formalized by United Nations Commission, uh, sponsored by the Canadian government uh, in, in 2000. And uh, it calls for uh, international intervention in cases of genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, or other crimes against humanity. And that was indeed embraced by the United Nations General Assembly in 2005. Uh, however, it's important to bear in mind that that approval that was given by that international body was contingent upon action taking place within the structure of the United Nations, meaning with the approval of the Security Council. And uh, as everyone knows, that approval is most unlikely to be forthcoming under current circumstances with an almost certain Russian veto and a probable Chinese veto. And so the administration finds itself in the, I think, somewhat awkward position of seeking to vindicate an international norm while at the same time violating an important principle of the international legal order. Uh, the objectives of the administration are also somewhat unclear. Uh, it wants to intervene. It's going to use force in a, uh, a, a big way, but a limited way. Uh, so it will intervene but not get sucked in. And uh, I think the record of the use of force despite the language that uh, may be contained in the congressional resolution uh, is one that uh, should uh, lead to some caution. Uh, once you're in an engagement of this sort, uh, the pressures to use force again uh, in, uh, down the line will also be very great. And I think that, that um, if there's a credibility problem now, that will not go away. And, the record of American force, not only over the last decade, but really over the entire post-war era, shows how kind of demonic that appeal to credibility and to the use of force on behalf of credibility uh, can be. Uh, that was a, a, a very critical factor in leading to uh, deeper American intervention in Vietnam. And uh, it's, it's something that uh, uh, can't really be controlled by the administration itself. It's also difficult to think of a precedent for this in which the intervention has as its object to uh, affect the use of particular weapons within an ongoing civil war. Uh, I suppose one could re recall the 1986 bombing of Libya, which was directed against Gaddafi's uh, bombings, uh, uh, various terrorist actions uh, uh, directed against American servicemen. Um, but in most instances of intervention, uh, that's not really the objective. The objective is to turn the tide of the battle on behalf of one or the other of, of the belligerents. And that doesn't seem to be the administration's objective now. Um, uh, finally, um, I'd like to uh, you know, invoke a saying of Clausewitz that um, he's famously known for having, saying, having said that war is an instrument of policy, meaning that it has to be um, seen in relation to or seen as means to the achievement of a political objective. But he also said uh, when he announced that, that policy must know the instrument that it is to employ. And the instrument that we are to employ, um, the big use of force against the, uh, the Syrian regime, uh, has, can have incredibly destructive effects and it can affect the fortunes of those on the battlefield, but it really can't shape a stable and constructive outcome. And I think that the use of force has to be measured against that uh, possibility of achieving that kind of outcome. I would say Dave didn't leave me much, and I'm glad to see all of you came, and why did you little bastards eat up all the pizza? I'm, <laughs> I'm hungry. I, I, have, I, I, may just, I may just go on strike up here, like a rap singer. But what we have, and, and I think, again, there's no, there, there isn't, any, there isn't any, re, any real whole card here, uh, I too, and my own politics tend to be to the right of Genghis Khan's 
by any standard, let alone the standard of this place, but I can see no common sense or national or state, state interest or indeed international interest in terms of the responsibility to protect, which is an ephemeral concept, an ephemeral concept at best in a world of nation states. And I can see no, I can see none of these, uh, none of these goals uh, being, fulfill, being, fulfill, being fulfilled here. Looking at it strictly in operational terms, if one wishes to consider, as the Obama administration seems to be seems to be presenting this, if one wishes to consider this as a punitive strike, a shot across the bow, a rap over the knuckles, a response, as Dave said, uh, a a response to an international outrage, even if it's carried on by even if it's executed by only one state, a response of that kind to be effective has to be quick. Any of you know that you don't discipline a child by waiting for two months before you ground them forever. You know, you, you, you move, you, you don't, nor do you train a dog that way. You move quickly, you make, your, you make your point, hit as hard as you wish, you calculate your force, and then pull, and, and then, and then pull out. Uh, this, is, this is a classic gunboat diplomacy picking up Dave's research from the 19th century and some of, uh, some of my own. You make a statement, you, you make a statement, you know, as Clausewitz says, what you want to do, you know the forces you have available, and then you, sh then, you, then, then you shut it down and wait for events. But we have been told that we're, going to, we're not going to try to destroy, to bring down the Assad regime. We're not even going to, to try to destroy his chemical weapons capacity. We're not going to try to diminish it, to diminish his infrastructure. Uh, we're simply going to hit hard enough not to be embarrassed. That seems to be the, the that's the, that seems to be the mantra. Now, this can be a legitimate, a legitimate act of policy, but to work, it had to have been done about three weeks ago. And the delay is simply may is, is simply removing any kind of any kind of any kind of credibility, kind of credibility from the process. A second point that is worth remembering, and again Dave mentioned this a, a bit, but going into it in a bit in a bit more detail, uh, Syria is not Iraq and is not Afghanistan. It has an effective military system. It has a good air defense system and a missile and, 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 and a missile system. And particularly if we use aircraft, if we use anything, if we use anything but you know, Tomahawk missiles and the infamous drones, uh, we may find ourselves, we may find ourselves with a little more in the way, a little more in the way of, a little more in the way of problems than we were, than we were expecting. Looking at it from the terms of the U.S. Air Force, it's been a long time since any of our attack pilots have had to go in against anything remotely resembling a serious ground defense. You know, they're used to a missile here and a missile there, but those are crafts that have to be learned. A third relevant point to remember is that in the last two years, certainly in the last two years, and certainly this year, the administration has reduced the size of the armed forces deliberately and as a matter of policy. After all, entitlements are important. We wouldn't want Sandra Flake to have to pay for her own birth control pills, would we now? So you cut back, so you cut, you cut, you cut back the Air Force, cut back the Navy, and what we have is very poorly deployed a lot of it stuck up in Afghanistan, a lot more deployed out of the Pacific for this shift that never took, that, that, ne that, never, never took that, that never took place. So in strictly military terms, in strictly military terms, there are some very, very strong reasons, very, there are some very strong arguments against it. And again, you know, I'll make the, I'll, I'll accept the point that both the, the the act of the action itself and the goals are extremely are extremely vague. The goals have been consi consistently the goals have been consistently shifting. They seem to be shifting hour to hour, as Ramesh Panuru put it in National Review. It looks like we're going to war to defend the credibility of a statement Barack Obama has denied responsibility for. He says I didn't. He says I didn't really. You know, say that there was a red line. Well, Bill Clinton didn't really have sex with that woman either, and uh, 
And I think that brings up a point that is worth, is worth making again. Uh, Dave talked about the credibility, of the, the credibility of the administration on the line. I asked the question, what credibility? I asked the question, what credibility? The, uh, the, uh, the policy of the United States, the foreign policy in the Middle East, if Bob Lee is able to define it rationally to make a, to, to make a, to make a case for it, I'll buy him the drink. I'll buy the drinks because he's a damn sight better man than I am. I cannot see what, particularly in the last two or three years, we have been attempting to do in the Middle East, except except if, if there is a, a connecting thread that I can see, it is a belief that the Muslim Brotherhood, that the Muslim Brotherhood and its offshoots, uh, its offshoots and manifestations can be the instrument of, if you will, the instrument of, of modernization, westernization, not even westernization, but of modernization and globalization that the administration, the administration seems to, seems to, seems to believe that it is. Accompanying this, is a firm belief is, a, is a, a firm belief, almost a religious, almost religious belief in the moderate Muslims, the Muslims who reject Islamism and who reject Muslim Muslim extreme Muslim extremism. Well, I study Nazi Germany, and during World War II, there was this big belief in the good Germans. All the good Germans who really rejected Hitler and given half a chance would rise in rebellion against him. Uh, and I think you, if you're looking for the moderate Muslims, the, West, you know, the, the most you're going to get is a very thin, westernized veneer, the sort of individuals who did the, the Twitters and the Facebooks in the early days of the, in the, early days of the, of the Egyptian revolution. And that veneer is going to crack and break like ice in a Minnesota lake, oh, about mid-April, because that's when spring comes, that's when spring comes to Minnesota. And it gets to be black ice, and you don't want to walk, and you don't want to walk on it relative to this as well. So we, whatever the reasons, we went into Afghanistan and Iraq. Since about 2004, for almost 10 years, we have really committed our resources, not for the vital interests of the United States, not for the vital interests of the United States allies, but to, to underwrite one social element, one political faction, one religious faction or, or another, somewhere in, somewhere, in the Muslim, somewhere in the Muslim world. And I would suggest that what it got us was Jack shit and Jack's on the bus out of town. We have not profited from this. We have not profited from this in any way. I can see blood for oil, Lawrence is not my blood, but I can, I can see a foreign policy pursuing oil I can see a foreign policy that pursues that, that pursues bases and pursues con pursues concrete interests. In as I say, from 2004, we haven't seen we, we haven't we haven't seen we haven't seen that. Now, Dave quoted Clausewitz. I can quote scripture. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, I think it's in Corinthians. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? The United States has got nothing but uncertain sounds and sour notes. And certainly in this case, we haven't. We haven't got anything. And I think it's fair that I can bring in a Russian proverb as well. And the Russians say, it is the wide road that leads to the war and a narrow path that brings us home. And I think that would be something for, be something for, 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 for all of us, for all of us to, to remember as we watch and keep our fingers crossed. And keep in mind, you know, according to the law, you women can be drafted too now. I mean, we, we, women want to women be in the front lines. I will share my right to be killed with any woman in this room, and I'll give you the big half of it. And I think I can say, speaking in Colorado College, you all voted for him. Now enjoy it. <laughs> Resist saying to Dennis right off that I defy him to cite any previous administration that had a thoroughly coherent policy toward the Middle East. 
it's just impossible because there are so many contradictions and difficulties and we've been faced with problems for a long, long time, like do we deal with dictators or don't we? And second, I would observe that dealing, <coughs> trying to deal, not to deal with Muslims in the Middle East is rather difficult too. Uh, these countries are dominated by Islam and so inevitably we, of course, we negotiate with Muslim regimes of one sort or another. But let me come back. First of all, I just might add that in my class today, which is the search for Islamic order yesterday and today, uh, doing a bit of Islamic history, we arrive at the point where the Islamic empire becomes centered in Damascus. Uh, the Syrians were at the center of things very quickly. This is 660, uh, solidified the Umayyad Caliphate in 692. Well, Syria has not been at the center of Islamic politics ever since, but it has seen itself as a very important player, and it's rather interesting that here we are talking about uh, Syria as, uh, as uh, the center of our concerns at, the at this moment. All right, I will not tell you the history of Syria at this point, although I'm tempted. Uh, the unhappy history of Syria, I might add. But rather, I will go straight to the question of the day. It seems to me there are two ways of justifying American intervention. One, humanitarian, anchored in a certain idealism. And the other, realpolitik, which leads in a somewhat different direction. Let me take them one at a time. <clears throat> Our humanitarian concerns are about the use of chemical weapons. Uh, Obama drew a red line on this ground, and it seems that some 1,500 people died by the use of chemical weapons. This is only a fraction, of, of course, of the people who have died in the Syrian uprising of the last two years. The, the death toll has put somewhere over 100,000 people. Uh, now, this is of some concern. I wouldn't want to minimize it. There are international conventions against the use of you know, chemical weapons. And it's very important, I think, therefore, that we at least wait for the United Nations report on chemical weapons, on the use of these weapons before we act, if we do. Um, I think it's also appropriate that if there is action, that it involve the United Nations, as David observed. So far, it's only the French who seem to be supporting us in this regard. I think we need much more broad, we need a broader international consensus that this constitutes, this particular act uh, constitutes such a heinous crime that there must be external intervention. There are certainly other roads to travel in trying to deal with this, with this uh, use of chemical weapons, including uh, court action, the threat of court action, uh, United uh, General denunciation of the Syrian regime, etc. I might add that while our, we have humanitarian concerns with the conduct of the Assad administration, and I am not a fan of the Assads, either father or son, nonetheless there are evidences of no great virtue on the other side. You probably saw the picture in today's New York Times of um, a rebel group executing soldiers. Um, and then, to compound the difficulty, the point that David already made, to intervene in this case violates international law, acting without UN sanction, as the Bush administration violated international law by going into Iraq without demonstrating there was great threat. The argument there with this was preventive war. I don't think that one works in this case at all. So it strikes me that the case to go in for humanitarian reasons is not very strong. And if it were, I, I think it would be stronger if there were general international consensus. And I also think it would be more appropriate to use something besides cruise missiles, which may well kill many more people, uh, than uh, to use cruise missiles to respond to this humanitarian concern. Certainly it is true in some cases that force have resulted in positive things, such as in Kosovo, Serbia. But I don't see that that's a, I don't think that's a probability here. Uh, certainly a more appropriate response, it seems to me, might be medical assistance, antidotes for nerve gas, international aid of some other kind. 
So I guess I am not for intervention on humanitarian grounds. The question then, I think, is whether it's worthwhile doing this for reasons of realpolitik, for re realistic assessment of the situation in the area. Realpolitik, of course, emphasizes the role of nation states, national interests, uh, the particular actors who are carrying out foreign policy. Uh, um, I think that there is, there is a certain case to be made for our national, our interest here in making some kind of action. Credibility is mentioned. A, the, this is an argument that can be certainly abused. But as I see it, credibility, the, the belief that we will do what we say we will do is very important. I care about two things, particularly in the Middle East right now. I don't know what to make of the Syrian crisis. I don't know how Egypt is going to turn out. But I really care about two things. One is the negotiations that have begun between Israel and the Palestinians. I would like to see those go forward and come to fruition, because I believe the resolution of this problem would enormously, enormously assist the United States in reconciling, coming to a coherent foreign policy in the area, which has been very difficult in the past. The second major thing I care about right now is negotiations with Iran, which have some prospect of recommencing and going somewhere. So the question for me is, if we do something or don't do something, how does it affect those two situations in particular, especially since, as David points out, the consequences of intervening in Syria are less than clear. I think, I think credibility is very important to us in these two sets of negotiations. I don't, Israel has been studiously non-committal on its, with respect to this United States intervention. Uh, but I think that credibility with them and with the Palestinians is vitally important. And if we do not act at all in this circumstance, we may find ourselves weakened. The, the, the position of the Iranians is uncertain as well. They have been repelled by the use of co uh, chemical weapons ever since Saddam Hussein used them against them, Iran, in the 1980s war between Iraq and, and Iran. They are not fans of chemical weapons. I don't know how they would respond to our particular, uh, our intervention in this particular case. Uh, so I think there might be mixed emotions in both of these circumstances, but it seems to me that doing something is probably vital. Now that the president, wisely or not, has committed us to this idea of a red line. Uh, Power is a strange thing, you know. If, if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you do lose it, if you do use it, you in some sense lose it too. That is, if you use it too frequently and too extensively, you overextend yourself and can't do anything. But not doing anything is sometimes corrosive because power depends in part on the perception that one has the capacity and will to use it. So I think we need to do something, but I think that I am uneasy with simply a, a cruise missile attack. I think we need to help the Syrian resistance as well. We've already said we are. So we're not exactly completely divorced from this situation. And I would add, I warn against thinking that the United States can somehow withdraw itself from the Middle East. It's just not possible. One, L. Carl Brown, a distinguished historian of the Middle East, calls the Middle East the most thoroughly penetrated region in the world, meaning that every dispute becomes international, and every international dispute becomes local. And it isn't a matter, okay, we can pull ourselves out, but Syria seeks international help. Uh, there are already all sorts of actors involved, and we're involved in some measure, albeit small, without doing more. I think we should increase our help to the rebels. This might be more effective than cruise missiles. I also think right now, if we, the president is authorized by Congress to go ahead with some sort of attack, he ought to do more of what Dennis doesn't like, and that is wait. <laughs> because waiting right now is, has the effect, I think, of simply tying up the Syrian regime and doesn't know what to think. People don't know what to expect. I don't know how long we can wait, but I think the longer we wait 
and figure out what is an appropriate response, the better off we probably are. We're achieving some result right now by threatening to do something and not doing it. So I would do something, could declare we're going to do something. We can't wait indefinitely. We can help increase our aid and perhaps provide some anti-aircraft uh, weapons to the, the, to the Syrian, free Syrian army, not to the extremists. Uh, perhaps some anti-tank weapons. We can be some somewhat, and therefore, if we intervene, we're clearly taking a side. We want to damage the Assad regime, I presume. And so we better do it with some effort to be consequential, to make some positive, to make an effect, to reduce the power of the Assad regime. Uh, I'm not very happy with this recommendation, but and that's one of the reasons I'm grateful I teach. I serve in the classroom and not in the White House making difficult security decisions. Okay, thanks. We'll turn it over to questions. It just occurred to me that Obama has pulled off a, a miracle on the Colorado camp, college campus, which is to get some of our most ideologically diverse professors to agree on one thing. Um, but anyhow, let's turn it over to uh, to questions. Since yes. Pardon? Right. What I'm saying is, and this is a, it's not meant as a, it's not meant as a straight analogy, but it's a good way of, uh, in Iraq, for example, we went in with the firm belief that there was an infrastructure of Iraqis that were, quote, small, westernized, that would be willing and able to govern the country in once Saddam Hussein and his, and his people were toppled. In the Arab Spring, you had the same, the same belief that the people who were doing the Twittering and were showing up on television would be the trendsetters in Egypt, in, in, in Egypt, in Tunisia. And this hasn't worked out very well. It hasn't really, it hasn't really worked out at all for a bunch of reasons. And my, again, my parallel there was that up until about 1943-44 World War II, in both the United States and Britain, there was a, a, a fair uh, a, a, a block of opinion in planning that if you if you appeal to them and hit them hard enough, you know, bombing up, blowing up their houses, this sort of thing, that the good Germans would turn against Nazi Germany. Would, would cease would cease supporting would cease supporting the Reich. It didn't happen that way. And the more we learn about the Third Reich, the more we learn the, the more we learn that, in many respects, it was the good Germans. It was the good Germans who underwrote the third, who underwrote the Third Reich, who felt that they were fighting for their homes, for a way of living, for a culture, and. I'm just suggesting it's the same thing. It's the it's the same thing. It's the same thing here. Uh, I very much agree with Professor Lee's point that in the Middle East, you're dealing with you're dealing with Muslims. You're dealing with Muslims, and the tendency I think is for this crust of call them moderates, call them anti-Islamists, whatever. It's a thin crust, and I think it tends to break under any kind of pressure. I find it interesting that in Egypt. That in Egypt, both sides seem to hate the United States equally. Uh, it was, I think, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a Muslim Brotherhood, a Muslim Brotherhood group that has portrayed Obama as the devil. You know, this is showing up. This showed up on one of the Arab television, the Egyptian television stations. It's damn near gone viral. I mean, you know, complete with the horns and everything. They shrunk the ears a little bit. Otherwise, the likeness is pretty good. But. It does seem to me, and again, I very much agree with my colleague, that there isn't, from the United States position, from the United the position of direct American interests, there's no good side. There's no, there's no, there's no good, there's no good side in Syria. I agree that it would be a good thing to support the the good rebels and see that this hardware, the missiles and such, 
don't fall into the hands of Al-Qaeda. Anybody who knows how to do this, even with a reasonable degree of, secu of, of, of security, then I'd sure like to hear it. Uh, I'm sorry, I know you asked me what time it was and I told you how to make a watch, but <laughs> I hope it was a reasonable answer, miss. And again, uh, I was not trying to suggest all Muslims are Nazis. And I can understand how you, you, you might have picked that up. That was not my intention. I'm just saying that looking for something that isn't there could get a lot of people killed. Okay. Yeah, nice. I would say that that would be a uh, marvelous thing were it to happen uh, if, if the uh, consequence of these breakdowns were the establishment of some kind of civil authority that you know, recognized you know, basic international norms. But the, the circumstances in which that's going to arise seem very remote now. We could just take a look at Egypt, uh, for example, and the military coup that just took place there. Uh, clearly, the Muslim Brotherhood constitutes a very significant portion of the Egyptian population, and it's very difficult to see any kind of stable situation arising in Egypt without some kind of recognition that those people deserve a voice in the political system. Yet. That's not the response of the military government. It wants to ban them, hound them, jail them, and kill them. And the, the you know, we have an incredibly diverse, pluralistic uh, set of sex viewpoints in the Middle East, but political systems that have a great deal of difficulty in accommodating that diversity and plurality. And it's just extremely difficult for outsiders to, um, to bring those norms to the fore. Uh, it's also extremely difficult in circumstances of war for those sorts of people to emerge on top uh, because the whole dynamic of war is usually to give uh, a greater voice to uh, those who are extreme and willing to use force to achieve their objectives. And that certainly is cause for concern in Syria. Bob mentioned the New York Times piece uh, uh, this morning showing uh, seven Syrian soldiers being uh, killed by uh, a, an al-Qaeda affiliate there in Syria, but more chilling was the fact that uh, the man responsible for it declared his determination to wipe out the Alawite minor minority in Syria. And, and so there's you know, very extreme agendas that uh, exist there that uh, I, I think outside force uh, has great difficulty really in shaping and controlling. Okay, uh, Professor Lindau. Well, uh, I want to play devil's advocate. Why, could you stand up so we can hear you? I don't believe in this argument either. So, well, maybe I'm not sure. Um, contextually, as the child of Holocaust survivors, I have always personally struggled defines a crisis as reaching a level of magnitude where it justifies humanitarian intervention. And so I mean, my, the moral question I have for you is, because I think this administration is also haunted, haunted by something we haven't discussed, which is the ghost of the line. At what level would you consider it so heinous, so atrocious, that the world would have to act? And do you need to have all the world to act in concert? States, you know, I certainly think the Russians have behaved in ways toward their own population that makes me dubious about their willingness to act in this way. 
is so high bound that if that's the test, then I'm not sure what genocidal acts we respond to. And so you said 1,400. Would we be justified in intervening if it was 10,000, 50,000, a million? There's 7 million refugees. At what point does it reach the test to justify the protect clause outside the United Nations, given the structure of the Security Council? In Starship Troopers, Robert Heinlein says one is enough. And I think that case can that case can be made. That it's not a matter, it's not a matter of numbers in in a, in a, in a situation like that. It is a matter of, as you put it, a matter of a matter of, of a matter of conscience, a matter of conscience, if you will. But uh, there's also it's the same there's also the issue of trying to do as little trying to do as little harm as possible. We have this same issue bombing Auschwitz in World War II. The, do you divert the resources? Do you take the chances? The, it, ran into the, it ran into sand. It ran into sand. And any intervention in anything remotely resembling a sovereign state, you political scientists are better at this, I think, than I am, but intervening in the borders of a sovereign, so within the borders of a sovereign state, sovereignty means that than which there is none above. And the United Nations is not a world government, nor is it ever is it ever is it ever likely to be. So, to a very great degree, Miss, you have a you have a reasonable point there. This is Syria. This is a Syria. This is a Syrian. This is a Syrian fight. And I'm not I'm not dismissing what Juan says. I'm simply saying that uh, I'm simply saying that acting on humanitarian impulses with pragmatic means. Is by no means a, is by no is by no means a, is by no means a dead surety. Again, I thought you had a good point there. To want to refer yeah. to it, if I may. Had a question. I, I just throw in one oh, comment. I, mean, yeah. I agree with Juan. Numbers are not really the issue, but I, I do have the feeling that we have responded in part and, and some others too to the fact that 100,000 people or 125,000 have died. The, the situation in Syria is terrible. It's a mess. But I'm not sure that we, we sort of hit on the chemical weapons thing as a means to go respond to this larger issue. And I'm, therefore, I, it, it, it's not clear to me that chemical weapons is quite the dramatic uh, moral issue that we're making out to be in this case, anyway. Uh, if I could say a few words about that as well. Uh, I, obviously, those uh, considerations are uh, you know, powerful, and it's it's very difficult to answer uh, in the abstract what the threshold should be. And I think it is true that in certain circumstances, the uh, requirement of acting in accordance with the international legal regime, which means, in the case of an intervention that would otherwise be illegal, securing the support of the Security Council, uh, is a consideration that can be. Uh, you know, outweighed by some kind of grievous humanitarian disaster. Uh, in the case of Kosovo, uh, you know, the United States did secure NATO authorization for that campaign. Uh, uh, that's not likely to be forthcoming in this instance. Uh, you know, there's not much international support for the American action. So we have a situation in which the world needs some kind of enforcement agency uh, in certain circumstances to uh, rally people to respect the basic norms of civilized conduct. But we have an international legal order that seems to throw up tremendous obstacles to any kind of effective action in that regard. And so the uh, solution to that quandary presumably is the untrammeled discretion of the United States President to use force whenever uh, he wishes. And uh, I think one could kind of recur to a, uh, the distinction that the philosophers make between act and rule utilitarianism, uh, you know, viewing an act in relationship to simply the particular circumstances 
uh, and the consequences that would follow therefrom, or viewing it uh, in terms of acting in relationship to a general rule. And I, I'm very uncomfortable with that general rule in which the American president has that kind of untrammeled discretion. And it seems to me very problematic to act you know, without much in the way of inter an international consensus, something that falls sh well short of the kind of uh, consensus that's often appeared in the past, as for example in 1999 with Kosovo, and to also act without the support of the American people, who are, you know, two to one opposed to this kind of uh, action in this instance. I mean, I, at the, uh, the uh, anticipating the follow-on and what happens next yeah. after you use force this time, I don't see a good outcome as following from that. It's okay, worth that's noting. It's, I mean, it's an interesting point worth noting if, according to our Secretary of State, if we can believe him, that the Saudi Arabia, Qatar, some of the other oil states have offered to pay the expenses of if America takes this takes presidential action against against uh, against the Assad government in Syria. What's that tagline? We know what you are. We're just talking price now. I never I never thought that an American American Secretary of State would suggest that the country and its armed forces just ought to whore itself. I am ashamed. And I, I didn't think anything John Kerry ever did could make me ashamed. But I'm ashamed of this. I, I will right. observe that we, however, were compensated we for our indeed. liberation of Kuwait we were by indeed. several as people. An, so we accepted an several billion dollars as in that. part of an organization situation. that contributed to this. It is one thing. It is one thing for me to take you out to dinner and have okay. you pick up half the check as a liberated, as a liberated, and emancipated, as a liberated and emancipated woman. It's another thing. Again, it's another thing to be bought and paid for. To assume that if I pay for your dinner, I pay for your company all night. Right. If okay. you don't mind. All right. We got. Do I make sense at all, man? Okay. We got that. about five Not or really. six. This, <laughs> this is where we are. This is where we are. Okay. In the world of Barack Obama. Okay. We got about six. Our bills paid by the Arabs to do their fighting for them. Mercenaries. Mercenaries. And that isn't the same thing as it was in 1990. Sorry, Robert. Bob, I will shut up. I promise to behave. I'm doing my best. Bob? Joining. Okay, we got about six hands up, so I'm going to take the questions in groups. We have a question here first, and, and I'm just, before they respond, if you guys want to take some notes and respond how you will to each. but. Uh, and then we'll go Tim, this gentleman in the back, and this woman over here. Um, okay. And so we'll start off with you. Yes. Radica, okay, Tim. Uh, Who is it? Did I get I the name right? You want to come back to, to okay the gentleman in the back and then over here
and went over here, and then we'll take some statements. Yeah. Number of you good seats here is asking to bring this. This past weekend, there was a protest going on against our entry into a war. It's going to probably get to be a bigger, bigger, bigger war again. And I was asked to bring copies of No Bomb Assyria down as little window stickers. And I'll be glad to put them up here, some of them. All right, great, thank you. All right, so let's turn to our panel and field these. David, do you want to start? Or? Uh, well, I'll comment on the uh, role of Israel in Iran. Uh, you know, in, in one respect, uh, I think that the events of the last couple of years have strengthened one of the things that the Israelis have always said, which is that solving the Palestinian problem you know, would not solve the larger problems of security and order in the Middle East. And, you know, the breakdown of all of these Arab regimes, I think, you know, gives some support uh, to that proposition. Uh, I, one of the points that has been made on behalf of intervening in Syria is that it's necessary to do so in order to send a message to Tehran and I think that that, you know, illustrates this sort of curious intermingling of humanitarian considerations and real politique that inevitably uh, affects decisions of this kind. Uh, the great German writer Frederick Meineke, you know, compared it to the uh, kind of mud-colored stream that uh, inevitably changes the dimensions of a humanitarian undertaking. And, makes it very much affected by considerations of state interest. Uh, and that's just, that just goes with the terrain of international politics and it's very difficult to separate those two things. So insofar as, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think that there's some kind of prospect that the new government in Iran uh, would be willing to entertain uh, a negotiation with the West in which it would agree to um, uh, uh, in intrusive international inspections with regard to its nuclear capability uh, uh, while allowing Iran some limited capacity for enriching nuclear weapons, and I think that that would be a desirable thing to pursue. Why but do I, you believe that, Dave, if I may ask? Uh, it's not a hostile question. What made you think that this is? Uh, well, Rouhani, back in the day, uh, you know, uh, supported that. And, and uh, in 2004, 2005, seemed to be very open to that kind of arrangement. And that would still leave Iran with some kind of limited capability to uh, uh, enrich uranium. And I think that that agreement would not be acceptable to the hawks with regard to Iran. But I would like to see the administration pursue it. I think the prospects of any kind of agreement on the Palestinian question are just you know, extremely remote at this time. I, the, the politics does not, uh, uh, in Israel and the United States and the region more generally, just doesn't uh, line up, as it hasn't for a very long time, for some kind of constructive outcome in that regard. That's unfortunate. I think the Israelis need to make concessions to the Palestinians out of a sense of their own purpose and interest as a nation, but uh, thus far under the Netanyahu government, they seem very distant from a realization of that imperative. I, I'm hopeful that, in fact, uh, the Israelis will come to see it that way, that the, the increased insecurity in the region, the chaos in the region is not helpful to them. And I think they need to think seriously about strengthening their home front and consolidating this Palestinian issue for which there seems to be no other solution. It doesn't seem to me that those Israelis who drag their feet on this have a coherent idea of how the state would function if they do not go with a two-state solution. They don't have a coherent plan for dealing with the Palestinians in another way. So I think they would strengthen Israel enormously in the region by doing this. Uh, the Palestinians may have their problems in agreeing to with it too, but uh, you know, I think I didn't think there was any prospect of getting negotiations started. But Kerry was has been very persistent in this matter. 
Uh, I think it does require that the United States pursue it with tenacity. And uh, we'll see whether, but that requires us to be able to focus on it a bit. And of course, things like Syria are an, an enormous distraction from this and from other matters. Okay, let's take two last questions and then we're gonna call it one right here and then, then one in the far back. And again, Tim's, Tim's consolidated his question to the book so we're ready to go. This is not a question. I'm just saying to all you registered voters, elect your senators and your representatives know what you think. Because you can't, they can't take it for granted that you think one thing or another. When you have studied this as learning as we have and reading what you have, let them know what you think. So take it and act according to that. Okay, thank you. All the way in the back and then Tim and then we'll have our final comments. For those that didn't hear it, now that they've uh, started to disperse their chemical weapons, does it degrade the security over those chemical weapons that uh, <coughs> extremists on the opposite side can get a hold of them? And then Tim, yeah. Um, what I want to say is that if the president could support a group in the Middle East to have them westernized, or have I been inclined to support Assad before the civil war as he seemed westernized? He studied in London, he seemed shopping in Paris, um, and also, he supported the Shah in the 50s because he was westernized, and that resulted in a lot of blowback in the U.S. So I'm not agreeing with your idea that there aren't reliable Western allies in the, in the Middle East, but questioning your belief that our, all our allies should be Western-oriented and westernized. I found out on that day that in any kind of a war, the tendency is towards, towards the extreme solution, towards Towards the, towards, the, towards the violent solution, uh, moderate voices, civilized voices, if you will, tend to be blurred and then silent. And the longer, it, if, and I, I sure take your point, but that chance was two years ago, if it was a chance at all. And I've heard a lot of talk about credibility. Your credibility is a little bit like virginity. When you lose it, it tends to be gone. <laughs> And the idea that it can be, that the credibility that we have sacrificed in the Middle East since 0304 can be, over a 10 year period, can be rebuilt by small gestures, small initiatives, is a little bit like trying to pull out a forest fire by spitting on it. I'm not, I, I, I see the points here, but honestly they seem very political science-y to me. You know, that it, if, we, if we do this and this and this, if we apply the method, if we apply the process, then we will get the product. And I am, as I say, it's a diff different perspective, but I'm very uncertain. I'm very uncertain on, on this. Credibility, it takes a long time. You don't build it back up in a hurry. Sometimes you have to change individuals. You have to change leaders to do this. Uh, to answer your question, sir, uh, on the question of the chemical weapons. There are, of course, a lot of them. Um, okay. The United States doesn't intend to bomb those. I mean, that could cause a uh, yet larger humanitarian disaster because of the toxicity of these things. And so uh, my understanding is that all of the military strikes will try to avoid any kind of uh, action against those chemical weapons facilities. And it, it's, I think, somewhat one can liken it a bit, perhaps, to the kind of psychological messaging that the uh, Johnson administration engaged in in 1965 with regard to North Vietnam. I mean, the intention was to send a message with regard to the tenacity of the United States that would lead the North Vietnamese regime to desist, and that is our intention now. It's to send a message that Assad will pay a price if he crosses this red line again. And, uh, you know, it's not out of the question that that could be successful, uh, th th that, that there will be such, a, you know, it would pose a price to him and that he will desist. You know, the Russians deny that he engaged in this action. And uh, 
you know, there is a particular odium associated with the use of chemical weapons that um, I think would further isolate him were he to engage in those actions further. You know, and it's also true that if, if even if the, uh, the administration were to desist at this point, it would not preclude the possibility of further action down the line, you know, if there were a greater amount of international and domestic support for it. Uh, but you know, that's one of the peculiarities of this situation that the particular thing that the Assad regime did is not going to be in any direct sense the object of our military strikes because of the danger associated with with blowing those things up. One question that's been tossed out is why would Assad, you know, this is the end of conspiracy thing, why would Assad, who seems to have turned the tide a bit in his favor conventionally, use chemical weapons? And a German, German intelligence offered an uh, uh, answer to that this morning that some of the stuff they've been intercepting, uh, they've got a couple of spy ships, intel ships off the coast, some of the stuff they've been intercepting was uh, the Hezbollah people said Assad lost his nerve to a degree and that was concerned about some of the setbacks, tactical setbacks in the Damascus, the Damascus suburbs and ordered the chemical attack. You might say because he is a civilian, he is an ophthalmologist, you know, he's not a statesman or a general, he's his father's son. I know how correct that is, I don't know. But I do throw it out here. It's as hot off the griddle as I can find an explanation for something that, in many ways, would it be reasonable to say would it be in many ways irrational in a Clausewitzian context? So why you? Yeah, and you actually you, you actually raise a very interesting point there, and that is that you know, uh, almost certainly the likelihood of the further use of these sorts of weapons will go up go up the more the Syrian regime believes itself pressed against the wall and having no alternative but to use them if it's going to save itself and avoid uh, the retribution that would undoubtedly follow its collapse. So it, 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 the, the intervention, in a sense, you know, could work both ways in, in, the sense, in one sense of decreasing the likelihood by imposing a price upon him, but in another sense, insofar as it helps turn the tide of military battle, increasing the pressure on him, uh, you know, to use whatever means are necessary to survive. I've got a question, Bob, if I could ask this. It ties in a bit. From the caliphates on, is it possible or legitimate to say that in the Islamic Middle East, conflict tends to be zero-sum, win-lose? and the compromise solutions have been temporary. Again, whether you're talking about the caliphates, whether you're talking about the national states, you're better equipped than I think anyone in the room then to address that. I, I wouldn't begin to know how to respond to a question that covers that many yes, thousand sir. years of history and That's examples and yeah. I, I, I can't, th I can't okay. think okay. why that would particularly be true. Okay. Uh, well, some of these early, early battles, I mean, we've just been reading a bit about some of the earliest battles that, and reading a book that argued that, that religious faith and fanaticism ha had a part, uh, really, that, that there were some believers in the very early going that set, that, that um, clashed with each other ideologically, and it did tend to be an all or nothing situation, but that situation didn't prevail beyond that. So. Okay, yeah. like I said, I just, you know, what, what would you thought? And uh, Bob, you also offer uh, PS 313 and 314 in yeah, spring that. to uh, cover that if you just put in a plug for <laughs> his two classes. In spring. Okay, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to you and thank you to the political science department for the pizza. <laughs> <laughs>